10 a.m. Um, we've got 50 people in the room. Good morning. Um, so thanks for being here. I'm Glenn Poole. I'm the CEO of the Australian Men's Health Forum. And this is uh, our Men's Health Connected Online Summit, which runs uh, throughout June. Um, today's session is focused specifically on working with older men. And we've got uh, a few different sessions running through the day, as well as some lunchtime lectures for those who are interested in an academic presentation. You're welcome to stay and participate for the entire day, or you can drop in and out uh, as you, you want to, to different, um, different sessions. <clears throat> if you've got colleagues who you think would particularly like one of the sessions, then you know, do please let them know. They can still, they can still jump on and register for this event and, and get on straight away. So the first session this morning is gonna focus on um, advocacy for for older men and for older men we're broadly talking i don't know what the correct maybe the people on the panel who work specifically in this field may have a position on this in my world it's always been 65 65 plus but there may be other opinions on that so that's our that's roughly where we're looking at when we're talking about older men um we've got a session on on advocacy we've got a, a session talking about how um how covid19 has impacted uh, different um different projects we've got a session looking at um the mental and emotional well-being of older men and you've got a couple of um academic lectures at at lunchtime the program is set to run until um a, a final session of up to 5 p.m to be honest we find that by the end of the session after lunch that's enough time on zoom and so what we do is allow about half an hour for people to have a bit of a network and reflection on the day and the session the, the days tend to finish by 4 p.m so um so that's just to give you a sense of uh, of what to expect and we'll have a mix of people in the room there'll be people working with um uh directly with older men many many older men themselves who are volunteers in sheds and omni groups and different organizations working with older men. We'll have some health workers and we may have some academics as well. So an interesting mix. Do please use all the features of Zoom today. Um, let me just again talk you through these one more time. Um, the place to go is you hover your, because uh, people are still joining, I can see the numbers going up now. So welcome to those who've just joined. Um, I'm just giving you some basic um, notes on how to use the room and then we'll be starting the first session in a second. So do please keep your microphones muted uh, because background noise can really spoil the experience here. Um, but we can also mute your mic if, you're, if it's interfering in any way. Um, there's a chat box at the bottom. The chat box is fantastic. If you've got access to a keyboard, it's a really good way to say hello, share information, ask questions, if there's particular organizations talking, we might post links there. Um, it's really encourage you to go in the chat box and even just to say hello and who you are and where you're from. So people get a flavor of the different people who are in the room and the diff different parts of the country that are represented, different organizations that are represented. Um, you can also use the participants feature next to the chat box. If you uh, click on that, that's useful. It gives you a list of people. Now here you can do things like later on, we might ask if you've got a question, you can actually raise a hand because what happens if lots of people talk on the mic at the same time, it really spoils the experience. So that's a place where we might ask you to raise a hand, but do start asking questions uh, in the chat box as well, because when it comes to the discussion part, we might pick some of the questions from the, um, from, from, from the, from the chat box. Uh, and also with the chat box feature, it means that sometimes other people may be able, able to answer questions for you. So you don't have to wait until the question and answer session. So it's a really, really useful feature. Um, and I really encourage you to use it. So um, there's one more thing on this bottom bar here that sometimes people use, and I'm going to use it now. And I might ask a couple of other people to have a go. So if you hear something you really like, um, again, along the bottom, because if I, if you, if you, I'm going to mute my mic in a second. If I clap, obviously, you, obviously you can't hear the clapping because all of us are muted. So there's, there is a, there is a, a reactions button. It's a little smiley face with a plus sign. You can click on the reactions button. There's two things you can do here. You can clap. I encourage a couple of people to have a go now. You can have a clap. 
Thank you. I see Gerard's clapping. Roger's got a thumbs up and there's a thumbs up. And that's basically, so yeah. So just a little nice way to give feedback because as a speaker, it can be an unusual experience because you can't smell the audience. You can't hear the murmurs. You can't hear if they're really appreciating what you're saying. Um, there isn't a thumbs down button in the reactions one. So the way you have to do that is just, just do that and, and, and do it with your face, I'm afraid. Or just leave, I think, is the way that you show you're not enjoying the speaker. And we've now got 63 participants. So the room has sort of grown by another 15 people or so since, uh, since, since 10 o'clock. Okay, enough. I will uh, officially uh, start the day. So good morning. Um, my name's Glenn Poole and I'm from the Australian Men's Health Forum. Um, I want to start the day by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where we all meet right across Australia and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Myself, I'm in central Queensland. Uh, this is where, uh, this is the land of the, uh, the Greng Greng the Garang, the Bunda and the Belai people. Uh, and it's also the place where Captain Cook first set foot on, uh, on, on land in, in Queensland just over 250 years ago. So holds a, a very particularly uh, a significant uh, place in, in our shared history. Um, uh, particularly around about this time when we've just come to the end of Reconciliation Week. So, I want to thank you all for being here today. It's, um, it's, uh, for those who don't know, AMHF, the Australian Men's Health Forum, is the peak body for health organisations and people working to improve the lives and health of men and boys in any way. Um, now, most people, when they think of health, think of medicine and prostate cancer and that type of stuff, all of which is important. But particularly those in the men's sheds movement and other move movements working with older men know that health is much more than that. It's about social connection and relationships and having purpose and value. And we really honor that whilst we're an organization that works with men of all ages and backgrounds. We really honor that focus on what socially keeps us well and keeps us, keeps us happy. So I think um, the older men's health movement in Australia really gets that. It gave the world the men's sheds movement and more besides. So this is the first time we've probably ever had a whole day dedicated to working with older men. And it's great to see that the vast majority of speakers we've got today are themselves men over 60. Um, and they're often uh, men working on a voluntary basis. We really want to give you the floor. So I'm going to step out of the way uh, and uh, be involved as little as possible today, other than just to make sure that the, the room's working well and that the day keeps moving along. So um, the first person I've asked to come and um, come and chair one of the sessions is both a friend and um, a bit of a legend in our men's health sector Hello. world. Um, I know he doesn't like me saying those types of things. Um, Dr. Anthony Brown, uh, been around the men's health sector for many years, is known internationally because he's the, uh, he work, he's, uh, he's the secretary or chair now of Global Action for Men's Health played a huge role in AMHF's history, also played a huge role in the history of the Men's Health Information and Resource Center, and has long had a particular interest and passion in working with older men. And I, I don't know if I get the words right, but it's something like he's a distinguished uh, member of the Australian Association of Gerontology. So we're in really good hands, and he won't thank me for bigging him up, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, I'm really delighted to, to be the first voice we have today to be Dr. Anthony Brown. Thanks for being here, Anthony. It's all yours. Okay, thank you so much, um, Glenn. And um, one of the difficulties, of course, about Zoom meetings and is that you can't see me blushing. So um, thank you for that very warm um, introduction. And um, I also want to, before we start, I do want to thank. IMHF for this um, for this day, not just for the series, the whole series around um, working with men and Men's Health Connect. It, it, IMHF needs to be congratulated. But when I first started, and when a lot of us first started, you know, working with older men and actually saying there's a need for us to bring older men's issues to the table. Um, Researchers need to spend more time 
understanding what's happening for older men. Services need to be more responsive for older men. And when we started saying those things 15, 20 years ago, um, there was, um, we were met with a lot of silence. There was um, both resistance, but also a bit of disbelief around, well, why are we, you know, focusing our, our energies around um, older men? If we're going to talk about gender and older people, um, surely we need to talk about um, older women. And, you know, while of course we do, um, what's been so exciting is to see how far we've come in that time and how many, not just the men's sheds, but a whole range of other groups have um, stepped up, often organised by older men themselves, um, to respond to those issues that, you know, quite frankly, weren't being heard or, or met anywhere else. So, um, yeah, AMHF is, is to be congratulated. And it's so exciting to me that we have, you know, so much expertise in the country that we can have a whole day of discussion around older men's issues. Um, just before I turn over and start um, our discussion with, um, with um, the speakers for today, um, there was a couple of things I just wanted to, to touch on. Firstly, um, just to remind people what Glenn said, and please use the chat box. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself, to ask questions, and <laughs> to make any comments. And that's really the best way that we'll um, pick up what's, what's being said. With 60 or so people online, um, sometimes it's, it's very hard to actually uh, have a conversation where we, we hear people speaking. So the chat box is the best way to organise that. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on that question. It's actually quite an important question that, that Glenn raised around um, who is old and who are we talking about when we're talking about older people's issues? Um, when I first started working with older people and older people's organisations, and actually that was with CODA New South Wales back in the 90s, um, that's when I first met Ian, so I'm very pleased to see Ian on board today. Um, I was jokingly told that, well, old is anyone who's 15 years older than you. Um, but actually, when we dig down into it, um, it can be quite difficult to actually say, you know, where is the the age where people start to experience issues to do with with, um, with their chronological age. For some people, um, if we're talking about some issues like nursing homes, well, then it's quite clear that we're talking about people who are mostly um, in their 70s or no, in their 80s or 90s or older. Um, but then when we're talking about people about retirement and retirement incomes, it can be anywhere between you know, mid 50s up to 70. And then if we actually start to talk about ageism in the workplace and people who experience difficulties because they feel they're too old or they're being told they're too old, um, we actually know that in industries like IT, that can start for people in their 30s and 40s. So it's a whole gamut um, of, um, of issues and around when people sort of start to experience issues because they're old or because they're told that they're too old. Um, as I said, they can start in the 30s and, you know, um, continue on. So, but what I really want to do is kick off a conversation with our panellists. Um, and we've got really an amazing um, and I think quite diverse selections of blokes today who are bringing um, discussions and perspectives from, from a range of areas. Um, we've got um, Gary Bryant, who's the CEO for the Council of Australian Men's Sheds Associations. Philip Green from the Men's Den Collective in Victoria. Roger Moulton, who's a family carer consultant at Ballarat Health Services, as well as Ian Yates, who's the CEO of Council on the Aging Australia. So what I'm going to ask each of our um, um, speakers to do is just start, start off with a short introduction about who they are and a little bit about the organisation they're working with, um, and specifically their interest in the topic around, around older men. So um, I'm going to start with Gary and then move to Philip, then Roger, then Ian. So you know 
where we're starting at. You're not just going to be um, called upon at, at random. So I might kick off with Gary. And Gary, if you can hear us, if you'd just like to give us a bit of a, an introduction and tell us a bit about the Council of Australian Men's Sheds Association and your work with older men. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to, uh, first of all, though, acknowledge the Wadjup people of the uh, Noongar Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land that I am on in Perth, Western Australia, um, and uh, their uh, elders, both uh, past, present and, and emerging. Um, the Council of Australian Men's Sheds Associations is the organisation that represents the state and territory uh, men's shed associations. Um, as an organisation, the council does not receive any funding from anyone and there's very limited uh, resources. We're all volunteers. However, um, three of the state um, associations receive funding from the um, state, their, their own state governments, and they have uh, considerable uh, resources and do a hell of a lot of work. Um, the Victorian one, you've got Lindsay Oates, who's speaking in the next session, uh, Western Australia, and you've um, got um, James Wild, he's the CEO, he's speaking in the next session, and also Tasmanian Men's Shed Association. So that's probably um, just a bit of background. So the council itself doesn't have a lot of resources, but those three state um, associations do. And, and of course, we're representing yeah, men's sheds and of course, um, a lot of men. My guess is that there's probably, well, we know there's well over a thousand men's sheds in Australia. Um, I would guess there's probably 1200, maybe more. Um, and they probably have about 40,000, maybe even up to 50,000 uh, members. So that's, uh, that's where I'm from. You're on mute, I think, Anthony. <laughs> I'm on mute, sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm assuming that everybody on board is familiar with the men's shed, but um, Gary, just in case we have some people um, online who haven't walked into their local men's shed, can you give people a bit of a flavour of what they'd expect? Or what uh, a men's yes, shed well, looks like are... to us? Well, they they are community uh, organisations, grassroots organisations. Uh, they're quite um, they're set up by local a group of local men. Um, uh, they generally will have some sort of a facility, generally a shed. Um, woodwork is carried out in most sheds, but they branch out into all sorts of other things, not just physical things like maybe metalwork and so on, but they could have community gardens, they'll have uh, singing groups, bands. Um, it's just really, it, there's no one size fits all. Every shed is different. And the things that happen in sheds um, really depend on the members of that uh, particular shed. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. And I can see that people have posted um, some uh, websites linking both to um, um, the, the, the Council of Australian Men's Sheds as well as the Australian Men's Sheds Association and you know, encourage people to check out um, those websites um, and to find out more about sheds. And people, please keep adding information um, and your own websites around the work you're doing with men in the chat. So thanks so much, Gary. Um, I might move on now to, to Phil Green from Men's Den Collective. Um, Phil, could you tell us a little bit about the Men's Den Collective and, and the work you're doing there with older men? Yes, certainly. Thanks and uh, welcome to everybody and good morning all. Um, look, uh, just quickly, I live in Eltham in Victoria. Um, I, I live at home with my wife. I'm retired, been retired for three years. And basically when I retired, I said, what am I going to do? And, and I'll touch this point later on. But um, I, had, I was given the opportunity to start a discussion group in an aged care facility. Um, and it was in a cottage which had men coming together once a week who had, all had dementia. And they were looking for some activities. They were looking at doing a workshop, uh, different types. And, and when I suggested, have you thought of something along discussion and connection and that, and they, they said no. So 
I started that three years ago and very quickly realized that I need a little bit of training in dementia. So I did a dementia awareness course with Dementia Australia. And then I realized these men are a little bit unique. Um, I needed to reconfigure the way that I ran these meetings and how things were said and done. And this meant changing colors, typefaces, and quite a number of things. And so when that configuration changed, um, I said, this is no longer like any other group out there. This is something unique. And I called it Men's Den Collective. So from that point, um, I changed and my focus has been opening up men's discussion groups in aged care facilities. Um, we, we don't want to be confused with retirement villages. We're talking about those people that spend 24 seven in an aged care facility. And these men are looking to do something a bit different than be sitting and doing activities with uh, women carers, which seems to be the predominant thing. So I, I, I bring into the facility somebody from outside, um, somebody that can share and talk about their experiences in the past, um, maybe some things that aren't going too good at the moment. We can discuss them in a very uh, confident private environment. And um, we also bring in some of their own experiences and, and we also talk about a specific topic um, at each meeting. Now, the meetings run for about two and a half hours and they're every two weeks. And they've been very successful. We've had a lot of positive feedback from carers, lifestyle managers, facility managers, and also uh, partners and, and wives of these men. So I, I know I've got a, a good model and um, I've got a big BHAG and, and that goal is to have a similar type groups in every aged care facility right throughout Australia and maybe the world, because I think it's needed. Um, and I know there's a lot, of other, a lot of other groups that do come together and, um, and run similar types of uh, men's talks and activities. But uh, I think that my formula is, seems to have been proven to be successful, so I'd like to see it kick on a bit further. So that's me. That's, that's great, Phil. Thanks so much for that. And I know when I was working with, um, with nursing homes um, in the 90s and working with um, occupational therapists and lifestyle managers, it was really clear that the models that we had for working with, those peop with people in nursing homes, with nursing home residents, um, that, that the way people were, um, were interacting just didn't work well for men. And I just had a, a question there. You said that you needed to adapt um, what you were doing after you'd done that um, Alzheimer's training. And was the adaption around adapting the Alzheimer's material to fit with the men or adapting the work you were doing to fit with the fact that they had had dementia? I, I, it, it's a good question and it's a combination of both. The, the training I did was in a room with about uh, 20 other women who are all carers within aged care facilities and they're all doing their, their specific courses to, of course, help them develop in their career. So I was a one only in there, but I was there to understand what dementia really meant. I, I had a perception of what it was. It was just people that were mentally unstable, I suppose is the easy way to describe it. But, once I understood there were so many different types of dementia, there's some 85 different types, I think at the moment, and everyone's a little bit different and a bit unique and, and understand that people with it on their side, looking forward, there are certain colors they can't see. There are typefaces that are not recognized. And, I see. Yeah. And all, so many of these things. So this is where I was able to bring those into the meeting so that they felt a little bit more comfortable uh, with it. One of, the, one of the unique things I do is, is I run a PowerPoint presentation for the whole meeting. And the, and the PowerPoint has actually got each of the steps we go through. So there's points and images. So that if one of them falls to sleep and wakes up 10 minutes later and says, well, where are we? He can look on the screen and go, oh, I know where I am. Or if he he's, needs to go to the toilet and come back 15 minutes later, he'll yeah. come back and sit down and feel quite comfortable where he is. And um, so there's no embarrassment of anybody having to do 
what they need to do. Um, so we have a collection of men in wheelchairs um, on frames, so just normal people walk in and out. But we try to make it a, a private environment within an aged yeah. care, which is pretty hard to find a facility that's suitable like, because most of it is very much open for them. So again, and I suppose I'm going around in circles a little bit here, but it, it's, it's those things that I learned made me feel more comfortable, which then I adapted to, that's, to suit the men. No, that, that's, that's a really great um, explanation that makes that clear. So thanks, Thank thanks so much. Thanks so much, Phil. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Roger, Roger Malton. And Roger, if you could tell us a little bit um, about you um, and, and your work with, with older men and, and what, um, what, what people are telling you. So we, we do have Roger online, don't we? We do indeed, thanks. Oh, there you are, hello. How are you? <clears throat> you can all hear me Good. clearly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am the, uh, the family carer consultant, aged and adult for Ballarat Mental Health Services. I commenced in this position in January 20. So I'm a, a new boy on the block and uh, enjoying at my tender years, a fairly steep learning curve. The position really is to provide the carers and family members with support, advocacy and information on mental health issues. Prior to this position, I ran an elder abuse prevention project for Ballarat Community Health Services, not Ballarat Health Services, Ballarat Community Health Services, and my area of activity in, in both uh, this present position and that position with Ballarat Community Health extends from Ballarat to the South Australian border. Most important to, uh, to keep that in mind because of, of rural and regional services, and I'll get to that a little bit later. My background is in agriculture and education and for the past 15 years in project management in environmental issues, mainly air and water, and more recently in project management of uh, issues related to community health. In 2009, both my wife and I were diagnosed with cancer in the same month. So we became carers and patients together we are now ten, both 10 year survivors. This experience led to a new career for me in community engagement and advocacy for cancer patients initially. Uh, and now it has extended to um, elder abuse prevention and also mental health services, specifically now with families and carers. I'm seeing that there are better services since I, I started this, this journey in uh, 2010 uh, and then worked at Ballarat uh, Health Services initially on a um, integrated cancer service or, or, or what is known as the BRIC, Ballarat Regional Integrated Cancer Services to involve consumers and one of the um, pleasing things is that we established sort of a mini Olivia Newton-John Centre uh, at the Ballarat Hospital, Ballarat Health Services, in, as a wellness centre. Uh, and this involved um, engaging with uh, con consumers in their journey and how we can assist them. I'm seeing that these cancer service patients in rural and regional areas uh, are seeing better services and more advocacy and more information is available. However, more assistance is needed in travel and accommodation services. Continued education on and, and continued education on lifestyle choices. Moving on to the mental health area, Information availability has improved. However, there is more work to be done in destigmatizing mental health illness in general and encouraging men and boys to talk more about their feelings and emotions 
and empathise, teaching people to empathise with one another. I think an example of this staying connected, uh, getting in touch with emotions requires people talking and listening and, and sharing. And I think an example here today is, is the, the men's shed movement, um, which are scattered around in the region that I cover as an example of the sorts of activities. There's lots to be done, especially in rural and regional areas. And uh, I would welcome any uh, sort of suggestions and discussion, listening, listening to discussion re revolved around that. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, great introduction uh, to, to the work that you're doing there, um, Roger. And what I think is quite interesting about um, your work as well is that this isn't a male-specific project, isn't it? You're not there as the men's worker, um, but you're, am I right in saying that your work has been around um, helping the agency work out what its response is and its way that it's working with older men? Yes, look, I, I must say it's not, it's, uh, not gender specific. Yeah my role certainly not but it does involve and also as you will read regularly in the press and the government has given recognition to this it's an area that interests me because um, men and boys uh, are in need of sharing and caring in this respect but no my position certainly is not gender specific but it does involve um, and an interesting, other than the interesting little story, in part of my chequered career um, between uh, contracts, I'm a keen gardener and I, I sold a 200 acre farm and went down to a, a backyard, which was mainly concrete and 20 by 20. So I had a little gardening round. And in that gardening round, my main clients for the, the, the time that I was doing it were older men. And so many of them, I found I spent as much time doing talking to them and listening to them at, at their desire as I did in actually doing the garden. So th this uh, developed my, my interest in this area. But no, the job I have at the moment isn't gender specific, but it does involve um, older men. No, that's great. Thanks, Roger. And the, the reason I asked that question was because I think what we're, we're starting to see today is that um, there's, there's no one size fits all when it comes to working with older men and some places like the men's shed and men's den obviously have a focus on men. Um, and that's, that's great. We do need male specific, um, services and responses, but we also need services, um, that are, are sensitive to and understand, uh, men's needs and men's ways of of um, interacting so both a gender sensitive and a male specific um, response is, is needed here. Um, next look I'd like to introduce um, Ian Yates. Um, Ian as many of you all know is the CEO of Council, of the Aging, Council on the Aging Australia um, and um, CODA covers many issues and advocates for many issues around uh, for older people and on behalf of older people. But um, I'd like to invite Ian to give a little bit of an introduction to CODA and its work and then particular reflections around how um, CODA's uh, work and interest um, specifically around, around older men. So uh, over to you, Ian. Thanks, Anthony, and good to see you again. Um, yes, the CODA or Council on the Ageing, or I'll just refer to it as CODA, uh, is a peak body uh, representing all older Australians, so it's not uh, male specific. It, obviously, it's it's uh, all genders uh, and transgender. Um, there's uh, there's a coder in every state and territory, um, and most of them have been around for a long time. Uh, we're we're about to celebrate our 65th birthday, and some of them are much older. Uh, and they, their membership includes uh, organisations of older people, but also individual older people um, who, who join uh, mostly state and territory coders, although Coder Australia now has uh, 
an online supporter list that's about 15, 18,000 people. Um, and that's, uh, and running Coder Australia is my day job. I might say, uh, apart from that, I've had a voluntary or appointed uh, involvements uh, in both South Australia and nationally in tertiary education in governments, university councils, uh, and in the health system, uh, chaired uh, Cancer Council in South Australia for many years, uh, and so on. So there's a whole lot of, of different things I do apart from, from CODA. Uh, but at these days, uh, CODA Australia is the national uh, advocacy body. Primarily what we do is, is work on developing policy, critiquing government policy and programs, uh, working uh, with our constituency to represent issues to the federal government. A uh, lot of advocacy, a lot of work in the media around that stuff. Um, I guess one of the things that I, and, and, and covering a, a huge range, so I mean, income policy, pensions, and superannuation, health, uh, physical health, mental health, dental health are big, have been big priorities. Aged care, where we've been leadership in pushing for reforms for at least the last decade. Uh, housing policy, financial services. Uh, we sit, for example, on the consumer bodies for Australian Securities and Investment Commission, for the Australian Competition Consumer Commission, the Australian Energy Regulator. We sit on the Australian Bankers, the Banking Association Advisory Body, so on. Uh, elder abuse has been a considerable concern of ours for, for many years. Um, and the whole issue, Anthony, which I think is really important here, of ageism and age discrimination. Um, and I just would also like to pick up on one of the points you made in your introduction, which is uh, one of the mistakes that is or has traditionally been made about policy around older people and therefore about older men as well, um, is to treat them as an homogenous group. Whereas, in fact, uh, older Australians are, are more diverse really than the whole of the population. Um, we did, uh, uh, we started something we intend to keep running every couple of years. Uh, we started in 2018, uh, a, a report, a survey report called State of the Older Nation. And we want to do this over a period of time. And one of the things that it's uh, rammed home, I think, to policymakers is the substantial diversity of older Australians uh, and uh, and, and in that respect, uh, one of the questions that was raised by Glenn early on is what is, what is old or older? Uh, and as, as someone said, maybe it was yourself, that if you're talking about aged care, you're predominantly talking about people in their 80s up. But if you're talking about uh, uh, employment issues, uh, and we think that employment is really quite critical uh, to, to what happens when you are not in employment, then you, you literally are talking mid 40s when age discrimination starts to become obvious in areas where it's going to be. Uh, and tackling those kind of issues is something that's, uh, that's been a high priority for us for a long time. Um, as you probably know, I think I can talk for a very long time about all those policy areas, but that's a kind of broad overview of where, we're, where we are. So for us, it's about sometimes quite specific things uh, and an example of that would be uh, banging on about the high, very high rates of suicide in very older men uh, which i'm sure everybody in the call knows are extremely high but then the more generic things about what's retirement income policy uh, working to make sure that when the australian government's developing a men's health policy that older men's issues are in that uh, and reaching out to the diversity of our constituency, whether we're talking about people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations, LGBTI people, uh, people from a huge range of cultural and linguistic diverse backgrounds, rural cities, etc. It's all of fitting all of those interests together so that governments are reminded that one size fits all does not work. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Ian. Um, and I suggest that one of the reasons why um, you, you, you can um, bang on about um, these issues for so long is because you're so well versed in them and has been, you know, so involved. I mean, um, for um, um, 
for a long time. And we, so you've already started to touch on some of the issues where um, things perhaps specifically um, affected men, like retirement incomes um, and suicide. But I'm also curious to know, like in your work with CODA and in the sort of advocacy and policy work you've been involved in, you know, are there any um, you know, other particular issues where you see um, that um, things play out quite differently for older men or older women, or in particularly areas where you think perhaps we need to do a little bit more work focusing on for, for older men? Um, ab absolutely. Um, I think, I, I mean, in many ways, the employment scenarios uh, are different, although that's changed and become more complex in recent years. Um, but, uh, and we worked, as you would recall, and a number of the state coders worked uh, in the, uh, closely in the early stages of the development of the men's shed movement um, as, as a response for the fact that in more traditional uh, occupations, many men, that was where they met other people, whereas their wives might have met a lot of other women in other contexts and the sheds were one, uh, one response to, okay, now that I'm particularly not working full time, how do I connect and meet these people? But I think the other, I would, I would emphasize uh, too that the, uh, and, and sorry, let me go back to that. In employment, what we see is a very significantly greater number of men working into their late 60s and well into their 70s. Women are doing that too, but actually it's a very significant number of men doing that. Um, I think that the health experience is different and we have seen, uh, for example, in the cancer space, that there are a number of cancers that didn't get attention for a long time that were specific to men. Um, and we've, you know, the pro there's been a lot of progress in that in terms of prostate cancer, for example, and bowel cancer, which, uh, which while it affects both genders, disproportionately affects men. Um, and then I, I just want to touch on and say what a fantastic job I think Philip's doing in his men's dens things, that actually a lot of aged care policy has been unconsciously not taking into account uh, men's experience. Uh, and it's, it is a very female dominated industry uh, and the experience of older men and the, the work that Philip's been doing there is something that we have picked up from actual consumers like what you do in aged care, uh, in residential aged care if you're an older man is go to basketball even class um, to have Philip engaging in discussions and things like that uh, is responding to a very real need that's been unrecognised for a long time. I could go on, but there's some examples of the fact that you need to look at it with a different lens. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Great. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Ian. And I think actually that point around looking at older men's experience and how does that experience not only differ from women's experience, um, but then how do we bring that experience into shaping policies and programs? Um, it is a really key question that I think we've, we've grappled with for a long time. Um, I just reflecting on my own experience, as I said, a number of years ago, I was working a lot with, um, with nursing homes and doing a lot of work around bringing um, volunteers into nursing homes to work with people who were, were isolated. Um, and what was really clear to me early on was that, that the model that this program used was one-on-one -on -one visitors um, with the idea of building up, you know, a special relationship with the nursing home resident. And while that worked well for women, um, actually it was really difficult to use that model for men. It, it just didn't seem to work as well. And then the problem was that men were seen as difficult, men were seen as well, not wanting to have friendships. But I found that when we actually brought a, a group of men in, from, in together as volunteers, and we had you know, a small group of men 
um, together, that men responded much more positively to that group interaction yes. than they did one on one. And you know, Phil, Phil's, you know, obviously seen this and and yeah. run with that time and time over. <laughs> and it just made me reflect on the the fact that you know, with the best intentions, people had set up these programs. Um, but they didn't really follow men, men's experience, and these were, and so the response was going to be inadequate. Um, and this was a group of men who were used, very used to socialising um, in a group, and sort of just working one on one didn't work for them. So, um, actually, Phil, I'm really interested to. Um, sort of to hear a bit of your re reflection on that. We have had one question come through around um, the groups and are the groups all dementia specific or in different um, aged care facilities? Is it, is it mixed with men who have dementia and don't have dementia or what, what, what happens in different facilities? Look, if I can use a term, inmates, everybody that goes into an aged care facility becomes an inmate. And it doesn't matter how their condition is, whether they're in a wheelchair or um, um, can't walk, well, whatever, um, health issues. Um, and, and I apply the same, you know, they're all men. Um, they've all had a brilliant life and they've all ended up in this facility, not because of their choice, and it's usually their family or a health or a doctor that said, you can't look after yourself anymore. And you have to go into some facility that can help and support you. So ultimately, we, we know the statistics of dementia, how high it is. And we're all either going to have, die from prostate cancer or dementia or, or death by some other means. Um, so... I, I treat dementia as a word, um, not as a reason for being in the group. It's, I don't even actually talk about the word dementia. I, I, it's the D word. And we all know that as we get older, we all get a little bit forgetful. My wife keeps reminding me that I can't remember certain things. Um, I sometimes question whether I have got signs of early dementia, but I know that I'm fairly cognitive. Um, so no, the, so simply, no, there is no class distinction between men with dementia, men without dementia or whatever. They are men coming together and they're just within a common facility. One of the most interesting thing is you find that men all of a sudden start realising that Joe Blow in the, the room down the corridor actually worked in the same industry as him. Oh, gee, I didn't know that. So then they start having a bit of a chat. Um, and you have other groups that, of people that start coming together within the group because all of a sudden there's an open, free environment to share experiences and, and their lifestyle. Um, and that, that's really fantastic at that feedback where that's happening because you know that at least something's coming good out of coming together. And men become very lonely in aged care. I know statistics have shown that I think it was 70% of uh, people in aged care were women. Well, that's, that is changing. There's becoming more men and of course more dementia and things like that. So I, I think the way of having a group of people coming together uh, is, is the way of the future. No, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Phil. I think that um, um, we see, and we know this doesn't work for all men, but um, those group type activities, you know, men certainly respond to and I just wanted to sort of go back to Gary because I think um, you know, the, the men's sheds, as we've seen, are that group activity, are blokes coming together um, you know, to, to, um, to work on projects. And Gary, I was just curious to get your reflections on that, on the, the, the men coming together. Because one of the things that I know the shed movement's been very strong about is reminding everybody that men's sheds are not a service. Um, and so I just was wondering if you could um, sort of unpack that a little bit, but also um, 
I'd be interested in your reflections about what happens when um, the guys who come to a men's shed come together um, and start making those connections. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Um, you know, I personally believe that probably the greater the men's sheds make a number of contributions to the health and well-being of of men who are their members. But I, to me, the greatest single contribution that they make is overcoming social isolation. And I think that's what, uh, you know, a number of people have mentioned already, you know, at work, men get a lot of their social contacts through their work. So when they stop working, where do they get the social contacts? And I think it was that motivation that led to the first um, men's sheds being established. They were established by retired men. And today, probably, you know, as men's sheds are being set up, it's probably a similar group that are doing that uh, still today. Um, the, sorry, what was the, the other point you wanted me to comment on, Anthony? Well, it was also around um, as the, the idea, and I've heard a lot of sheds and shedders say this, that we're not a service. Ah, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Some people um, think sheds are probably a service provider. You know, they're a home help service or something similar to that. Um, the sheds, um, you know, they are, they are a community club. Um, they, you know, are there for the members. Now, they certainly probably just about every shed is also very active in their community. So they do take on projects in the community and they provide a lot of, um, you know, support to, to various other groups in the, in the community. But yeah, the, and if somebody came along and said, um, you know, look, uh, my chair is broken, do you think you could fix it? They probably would but they're all volunteers. Um, if somebody said to them, um, you know, the, the, the fly wire door has fallen off, do you think somebody could come around and help with that? And if the person was, you know, like, you know an elderly person or somebody who didn't have the, the means to pay a tradesman to do it, then they would probably help with that. But they, that's at the discretion of, well, not just the shed, but really of, would a, a member of the shed be prepared to be the volunteer to go and do that? So they're not a service provider. Um, the other thing on service providers is probably the health education services. Uh, they have great difficulty in contacting um, older men, or men probably in general, but certainly older men. And a number of them will be contacting sheds to say, oh, look, can we come and talk to you about whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, prostate cancer, dementia, whatever it happens to be. And um, sheds generally would probably have a guest speaker once a month or something like that, but they are also somewhat, um, you know, over, uh, you know, the requests are sometimes overwhelming <laughs> for, you know, other groups that want to come in and get this captive audience of, of, of men. I don't know whether that clears or answers what you were asking. No, it, it really does, um, um, Gary. And I think it brings up two really important points. One is that actually there's a danger when we're talking about older people in general and older men specifically, that we just talk about their issues and their problems. And, and of course we have to. But we have to remember that older people actually make huge contributions to society. And you know, I'm the, I used to work in um, Richmond in, in Sydney, and I know that the local shed there did a lot of work contributing to the local community. So the, the neighbourhood centre had, um, uh, shelves and cabinets sort of made for them by the men's shed. They did things at the the public school, um, like created a new notice board and sort of did some handyman work for them. So actually, um, the men's shed was making a big contribution and helping out all these other organisations, um, you know, locally. So that contribution um, that older men make and that older men make sort of by continuing to work, um, Ian mentioned that men 
tend to be working into their 60s and 70s much more than older women. And while I'm sure some of them perhaps don't want to be working or working as much, I'm sure a lot of them are um, actually still finding a lot of meaning and enjoyment um, in, in their work and the contribution they make through that. Um, but the other thing, and this is what I'd like the, some of the, um, the other um, uh, speakers to reflect on. Yes, yep. Yeah, can, can I just make two other comments if I could please? Sure. Um, first of all, on the contribution to the general community, I think men's sheds are one of the most valuable contributors to the social capital of mm. their local community. I mean, they, they, because of all of the different things that you just mentioned, where they'll help other groups in the, uh, in the community in a whole range of different ways. And the other thing I wanted to mention was about men's health. Um, the men's sheds make a huge contribution to the health and well-being of their members. But for the health promotion people out there, <laughs> it's not so much that they hear a talk about some aspect of men's health. It's when they're sitting around at morning tea yeah. and having a chat and somebody says, oh, geez, I've got to go to the doctor and, you know, I've got to test my prostate, and, oh, you know, and somebody else says, oh, that's okay, I've had that or I've had prostate cancer or whatever it happens to be. Or, you know, oh, you know, I, I can't get on too well with my, uh, you know, son or something like that and say, oh, well, you know, and they have a, they have a talk to each other. And uh, a lot of the, um, particularly those, um, and I say well-being, uh, particular the well-being issues are really fostered, um, you know, through the men's shed. And it's, it happens informally, or just two men together. And there's a saying that men, uh, you know, talk not face to face but shoulder to shoulder. And if two, you know, a couple of men are working on a project together, they're probably, you know, hands busy doing whatever it is they're doing, yeah. and they'll just start talking uh, about things, you know, oh, how are things going, or, oh, yeah, not bad, you know, I've got a few health yeah. problems, yeah. I've got a few other, you know, financial problems, or whatever it happens to be, and that's the way that the men talk. No, that, thanks, Gary, I think those reflections are really important, and, um, you know, I, I personally, I love that saying about men, not talking face to face, but, but shoulder to shoulder. And one of the things that um, I was reflecting on as you were speaking was um, health services and other groups that want to connect with older men um, do try and you know, do this outreach work with sheds and with other groups and people who've cracked it. And that's great. But what I think um, is needed, and perhaps this can be the next part of our discussion, is actually what are the things that we've learnt from groups like the men's sheds, from the men's collective, from the work of people like Roger? Like, how do we, you know, who are connecting with men? And I think really putting, um, challenging that idea that older men are difficult to engage with. I've, I've never found that. I just think we're not engaging with them properly and the problem's not always the men, the problem's often the services. So how do we get those learnings about how sheds have engaged with people, how men's dens engage with people, how Roger as a, um, as a sort of individual practitioner and you know as many of the people online have experienced, how do we get those learnings that we can then take back to services and say, actually, there's things here that you might need to change around that will help you connect better with men. And so actually, I might just turn to Roger because I'd be really keen to hear about things that Roger's, um, Roger, about your experience of working with men um, and also around some of the challenges that um, either your organisation or your funders might have when you've sort of suggested doing something a bit different to, to reach men. Thanks, uh, Anthony. First of all, I couldn't agree more. Um, it, it is, uh, there's a gap there and uh, breaching that gap uh, is, is so important. Uh, first of all, the, I'd, I'd like to use an example. 
Another hat that I wear in a voluntary capacity is that I do quite a bit of work and have for 10 years with Cancer Connect. And Cancer Connect, for those who, who, who may not know, uh, is an, an, an organisation by Victoria Cancer Council. I think every state has a Cancer Connect. In fact, it is Australia-wide. Uh, it's an area where you don't offer technical support, but you offer a listening ear. And that listening ear is backed up with a similar experience. In my case, it was prostate cancer. And for the, the 10 years, I think I've, I've had um, uh, 90, 92 connections. Uh, so it's a couple of months, a couple a month. And the most important thing I believe is to not have strong personal opinions and try and tell um, men uh, what you think they should do. I think you, you need to listen and share your experience. And in doing that, you give that person another experience to consider. But a lot of, as an example, my uh, role there is to, I had external beam radiation for localised prostate cancer. And I'm usually called up by uh, men um, who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer and are in the position to make the decision whether they go complete um, prostectomy or uh, uh, external beam radiation. Now, I'm not there to tell them which I think they should do. I'm only there for them to ask me questions, to listen to their story, for ask, ask me questions, and then premise what I say to them by saying that that's my experience. Others may be different. So this is, this is why I go, go back to my original um, suggestion about empathy. You've got to put yourself in other people's position and you've got to listen a lot. Thanks, Roger. And I think um, I can see in the chat, there's discussions around listening and empathy. So I think what you're saying there is, is really striking a chord with a lot of people who are on the call. Um, and what um, I'd like to do is actually ask Ian, as the leader of a national organisation and as the leader of an organisation that's um, really is working to advocate older people's issues. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts about how do we, where are the points where we can try and change the system and take these learnings and take the experiences that we've been talking about today, both the experiences of the men and the experiences of people working with them where are the points in the system where we can try and um, direct that to, um, you know, to, to bring about sort of some positive change for other men? Thanks, Anthony. That's a really good question. And I've just been sitting here listening to those, you know, to, to my colleagues talking about it and reflecting on how poorly frequently policymakers do do that. Um, and one of the things that we've battled, for example, throughout some of the aged care reform change is um, our process would be to be working and meeting with people as close to their own turf as possible. Um, whereas, you, you know, it's, it's not unusual to see a department in Canberra say, oh, let's bring, uh, let's bring a group of consumers to Canberra and we'll put them in a room in the department for a day and then they can, you know, tell us their perspective on things and then present them with a whole lot of documents that they've already prepared and ask them to comment, which, of course, doesn't work. And yet they think that they are trying to do the right thing. So I think we are slowly convincing some of them that what in the jargon we call, you know, engagement or co-design is actually going to be productive and that if you want to find out about people's experience, it actually has to happen in the context of where those people's experience is happening. Um, and I'm pleased to say that that in our own uh, relationship with uh, the Federal Health Department, which is one of the 
sources of our funding, that's been recognised and we're right now engaged in discussing how that might, process might be resourced so that they, they can actually learn. Can I say too that, an, that another area that I think is important, and I understand if there's a cynicism about this, but uh, another area of that making that connection that's important is talking to local parliament, local members of parliament. Um, there's a, a significant sensitivity in every minister's office to representations being made from the backbench um, and making sure that those backbenchers know what's going on. Uh, they are, one of the ways they make their presence feel is making representations to ministers and so on on behalf of their constituency um, and raising it in the party room and those kind of things. So I think uh, that's, an, that's a channel that because of our cynicism with politics, we often probably discount, but I, from what I see in Canberra uh, has a lot of power. Um, making making sure and 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 not uh, you know it's not about party politics it's about you represent this whole electorate uh, we're part of this electorate these are the things we're doing these are the things we're concerned about uh, that for, for in most cases I mean there are exceptions but in most cases uh, local members are receptive to that kind of uh, that to that kind of message uh, if they're not then you need to do something to stir them up a bit, but um, I, I find them a very valuable tool in trying to get issues onto the agenda of parties that when, when sometimes you can't by going direct to the person who's the responsible uh, minister. So I don't know if, if that helps, but that's a couple of, of comments. I, I just think frequently, far too frequently, what we see is, is the development of policy that's that doesn't have appropriate context uh, to it. And it's been interesting to see that change a bit uh, during the current COVID-19 crisis in certain areas. We've found a willingness to actually listen to what's happening out there uh, that hasn't always been present and a willingness to be flexible about decision-making as well. No, thanks. thanks for that, Ian. I think they're, they're really um, pertinent points. Um, particularly the local member, because local members often like to be cutting a ribbon at a shed and see the sheds as a good news story. Um, and I'm not just focusing on sheds, but um, when it comes to older men's issues, they're happy to be photographed opening the shed. And, you know, maybe we do need to take those opportunities to make sure that they hear some of the stories that are happening in the shed and, you know, and, and in other places. And, I'm also glad that you mentioned um, COVID because in my work um, around, again, working with health, um, health people and, you know, listening to the experiences, you know, of, of local people, I've certainly found that they've been more responsive um, at the moment. And I just wanted to ask our speakers, and I'm sorry, but this isn't something that we'd ask you to, to think about previously. But I'm just curious to know, with this current experience of COVID, what have we, I'd be keen to hear from each of you about what do you think we've learned and what particular challenges, you know, your groups faced and hopefully overcome around uh, what's going on now. So um, I might just start again in that same order and ask Gary, then Philip, Roger, and then Ian to give some reflections. But Gary, you know, the sheds are places where, you know, it is all about coming, to, you know, to being physically in the same space and, and, you know, to use the equipment that's there. So I'd be really interested to hear about how the sheds have sort of tried to overcome some of that, you know, in the current situation. Um, yeah, I think probably both uh, Lindsay Oates and James Wilde in the next session are probably going to be able to give more uh, information on this than I can. Um, the uh, sheds, of course, had to close down, as did every, everything else. Um, I think individual sheds, they 
worked out ways of having uh, contact with their members or setting up telephone trees and different things like that so that they were keeping in touch with their members. Um, largely, I think, by phone, but, but, you know, to some extent, they may have been running Zoom and other things. Um, the Tasmanian Men's Shed Association, they received a grant from the Tasmanian government uh, to uh, particular to address the, the whole thing of right over the sheds are closed down. How are you now going to be able to keep in contact with your members? So there'd be, I'm sure, those sorts of things happening um, around, uh, you know, sheds around around Australia. Um, yeah, so that that's that's probably uh, where things are at. In terms of sheds now reopening, um, restrictions are being lifted. I know in Western Australia, a few sheds started to reopen from the 15th of uh, May. So they've now got two, three weeks experience of operating. They've had to have guidelines on being their COVID guidelines in terms of, you know, how they are to operate and, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, James Wilde will be able to give more information on that. Sure, sure. Thanks, Gary. As I, as I said, this was a bit of a question without, you know, um, without notice to everybody. But Phil, I'd be particularly interested to hear what your experience has been in the past few months because nursing homes are quite understand quite understandably been very um, have limited you know people coming in and sort of having gatherings and you know what's that meant not just for your service but what do you think it's meant for the guys who normally come to your groups? Yeah, look, it's a really uh... A lot of answers <laughs> and probably ask more questions because of the answers but if, if I can just um, say something about what happened to me when the aged care facility shut the front door and said right no one can come in I, my immediate response was well what happens to everybody with inside so we no longer get together we no longer do the things we don't we what happens so um, I spoke to several of the, the uh, lifestyle managers and I said, look, I'm prepared to write a newsletter every week and email it to you if you'd like to pass it around to all the men. It doesn't matter uh, if the men are part of the group or not. I'll, I'll send a newsletter in. Uh, maybe you just want to have a little talk groups or whatever and give you something to talk about. And so I started producing these and my 11th issue went out last week and the newsletter basically is two pages. And I, I try to keep it as simple as possible. Just a little update of what's happened with COVID, a little bit of history of what happened 10 years, 50 years ago. Um, we talk about, because we have a discussion topic at every meeting, I still include those in it and talk about some of those of which, you know, National Sorrow Day and Environment Days and things like that. So we talk, talk about that and add some jokes, um, some, some fun jokes, uh, you know, and pictures and things like that. And the feedback that I've received from the facilities has been fantastic. So I said, oh, you're bringing something new to us. Like we, we couldn't think of these things. You know, you, the guys really like it. And um, many of them will sit and read it and then they'll read it again and read it again and wait for the following week. So that as a substitute of not doing face-to-face -face has been, um, has worked um, but again it starts to get a bit thin after 12 weeks or so so I think everybody's waiting is when the doors open so we can go back and get yeah. back to a face-to-face -face situation so yeah using that as example of going around the tree um, it worked but not long term what I see is, is it's the biggest fear of if there's going to be a second wave of COVID what that's going to impact the normal community and also the health. Yeah. Um, is, or when are we going to be totally open again? You know, and, and aged care facilities will probably be the last um, market that reopens its doors um, because of their clients um, and people coming in. So we're, we're still in this world of not knowing where we go. We're, we're still day by day, yeah. week by week moving forward yeah. where a lot of the other groups uh, on these um, men's dens and men's sheds I mean um, can open um, their doors and do things a little bit more yeah. flexible so um, and I, yeah. so that's probably my answers 
Look, one of the things that I'd like to raise is what could be done better in the future. Is I, and, so I, and this Phil, is a great forum. Yep. Yeah. Phil, I, I do. That's what we're going to finish on. Oh, okay. But, and I just wanted to just quickly um, check in with, with, with Roger. Yep. But um, I also want to say, just looking at the comments, that you know, people are really um, liking the idea of the newsletter. And I think what that shows is, and um, Gary mentioned telephone trees. I mean, gosh, I haven't heard about telephone trees since, you know, the 80s and 90s. But, you know, in times like these, you know, sometimes those simple old-fashioned solutions that we've almost forgotten about, the low-tech ways of doing things, you know, can come into their own. And so, you know, sometimes we can dust some of those off and, and get going again. Um, and Roger, um, I'm, I'm, I know we're running out of time, but Roger, I'd be really interested to hear what, um, not just about maybe some of the things that have changed around connecting with clients, but um, with the work that you're, you're doing, is there anything that, you know, is coming up around um, the men that you're, you're talking to at the moment, you know, that, that COVID is bringing up for them, any sort of, um, you know, issues that older men are, are, um, are bringing up, as well as different ways that maybe you've needed to connect with them? Sorry about that. Um, I was thinking about the question. <laughs> um, there, there is a lot to unpack there, Anthony, and I appreciated what Phil said, uh, said with the examples. There's lots of, lots of positives and the negatives. I think the negatives at the moment um, are still to be seen from the point of mental health. We, we, can, we can understand loneliness when people have to um, isolate. Uh, but the, the long-term mental health issues and the impacts uh, are yet to be seen. Putting, putting that aside for one moment, the positives that have come out, we've already seen in the examples that Phil's have raised, I think adaptability. Um, we've learned more about technology. A lot of us here and the 60 or 70 people um, using Zoom That's today. Right couldn't have done that, uh, oh, well, I wouldn't think, I certainly couldn't have done it three or four months ago. Um, so there's these aspects and also using social media more. We've learned how to communicate effectively using that technology. So there's been a lot of innovation and there's heaps and heaps of study to be done to, uh, to unpack this, to find out what benefits. But generalising, I think they're, they're the positives, the, the negatives, fear, loneliness, and the impact that has on mental health is still to be seen. Anthony, can I follow on from that before you cut to me? Um, I, many, many things I could talk about from COVID uh, from a national advocacy perspective, let me say that uh, one of the positives uh, that has happened, and I hope they can learn from it, uh, is that government, uh, governments and departments have learned how to be agile and flexible um, and have, have broken all their rules um, uh, about proper process and so on to, to actually get things to happen. Uh, and that's been an intriguing exercise for them and I see it face to face and up close. But two, two points I would like to make. One is specifically uh, when, about aged care residential aged care, uh, to say that what we saw understandably was a kind of lockdown approach, uh, but, you know, lock, and, and that's how they handle things like flu outbreaks and so on in normally. But over time, what we saw was no strategy for moving beyond that, even when COVID was disappearing in, in community. And the real, the real reason that aged care has escaped from the major COVID uh, problems is because the community has escaped from it. If it's not present in the street, it's not getting in your residential care facility. So we initiated uh, 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 a, what's called a, a code for visits, uh, a visiting code that all uh, aged care facilities should be following uh, because we are going to have to have restricted visits for quite some time because of the vulnerability of the population. But that should not mean no visits. And if people are not familiar with this, You'll find that visit code on our website uh, at coda.org.au. Um, and, uh, and 
the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission that enforces standards is using that code in its discussions and dealing with complaints about visits. And I would say to someone like Philip, uh, it ought to be it ought to be quite possible now for an aged care facility to arrange that Philip can safely enter and engage in uh, socially distanced conversations that he used to have. It ought not be beyond their width. They've got staff coming in and out every day. Uh, they can arrange for regular visitors who are who are prepared to go through the the, the screening processes to do that. The second point I want to make uh, is that is to underline what I think Roger was just saying, which is about social isolation. We are starting to see, uh, and Minister Richard Colbeck, who's the Minister of Senior Australians, uh, was talking about with the, this with me yesterday. They are starting to see that some of those uh, through survey work, some of the long term implications of isolation, um, which are going to be dramatic and are going to roll out and. Just to say to the whole network of people who are, who are on uh, this hookup, uh, really to, to, to think about how to reach out to people who have what I would call ultra isolated, uh, you know, because of the fears and to, to find ways to reach to them, to, to connect to them. There is an older person support line, uh, which we and other consumer organisations are running and you find that on our website too. But a lot of people have actually locked themselves down really heavily uh, because they were scared and that's understandable. Um, but then they actually have a strategy for coming out of isolation. Uh, and we are, we're currently working with uh, the Australian Health uh, Protection Council uh, and the National Cabinet on some guidelines for, for older Australians uh, in this context because the messaging is pretty confused at the moment. Can't hear. Anthony, you're on mute. I know, I know. You've missed all my words of wisdom. I'm sorry. I was and, just, no. Can I just ask, did you explicitly ask that well, question so, or sorry. was it obtained from... Annette, in the Annette, background. Annette, sorry, thank yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Ian. And this conversation about older men and COVID will be continued um, at 11.45. But I just sort of did want to bring that... Um, so that uh, bring that in briefly to this discussion to see you know what we have learnt because sometimes um, you know these emergencies you know do reveal um, new and better ways to, um, of working. So we only have a few minutes left, but I do want to come back to Philip and hopefully if we have time to get to all of our speakers to touch on that point around you know what isn't working well and what we could do better in the future that you were going to just mention, Philip? It's the returning to normal, isn't it? Um, I, I think this is putting a stake in the ground, what we're doing right now. We've, we've got a collective of ideas and initiatives and, and we, we all know that there's things that we're doing right and there's a few things that we probably want to redo, but that's in the past. And I, I think as a collective of people all around Australia, we, we need to sort of do something in some common way of rollout. Um, when we went into this COVID environment, we were so fragmented. We were, the whole community was just going in all directions, thinking, what do we do? What do we do? And we're all, um, I, I, from my perspective, doing a lot of the same. We've, we've come back to find ways. We've, we've come back to Mother Earth, some simplistic lifestyles and they've been successful. So moving forward, I, I would like to see something, whether it's through Ian and CODA or, or other groups, uh, national groups, where say, look, this is how we're going to move forward. Um, try, would you like to join us in moving forward? So we've got more of a single voice going into the marketplace, which covers men, half the population. Um, that, it's a big ask, but it, uh, I think that would be a great step forward if we could do something like that. Um, and of course, overcoming the second wave of COVID, um, yeah. uh, the big unknown, no, what it's going to do. So no, that's that, that my two sort of perspectives of, of yeah. what I see and feel. No, 
they're really helpful and I think discussions like today are a good way to start to see what what's working and how we can bring that together mm. um, and and because people have been working on some of these things for a while um, but how can we bring it together and continue to advocate um, yeah. for these ways of working um, I'll just ask um, Gary and then Roger for their sort of final reflections and, and ideas on you know, what, what we can do better in the future. So Gary, would you like to un un unmute myself, <laughs> which I have now. Um, look, uh, in terms of COVID, I think uh, the next session will give a much yeah. better idea than I can. My thoughts are really running further ahead. And that is what can we do for older men and generally for men and boys um, into the future? And I firmly believe that uh, AMH, Australian Men's Health Forum, has got a critical role to play in that. The sort of things it's doing this week, or this month, is, is a sort of one of the things. But in terms of being an effective um, advocate, I believe there are sort of three things that, that qualities that are needed and probably no organisation or individual can adequately fill all three. So it's a matter of developing partnerships. And I think um, AMHF is a key one to sort of be the, uh, the catalyst or the facilitator or whatever. But one, you've got to have the expertise and the, um, the know-how of whatever the issue is that you're, you know, wanting to address. Uh, secondly, you need to have resources, um, you know, money, time, which generally means staff. And the third thing is you need to have uh, sort of influence and credibility. Now, AMHF are certainly very high in terms of expertise. Um, it's got some resources. Uh, when it comes to really being able to influence government and so on, I'm not sure whether it's got a great influence. Whereas an organisation, say, like COTA, has got considerable um, influence and that would be an ideal sort of partnership to develop, but it might be that broader coalitions also need to be developed. And the other thing is it's not just organisations, it's also individuals. And I'm just thinking of somebody like, uh, you know, to have a champion like, say, Dr. Norman Swan, if he was to take on, uh, pick up the baton for men and boys, um, the social determinants of health and so on, mm -hmm. I think that would advance uh, things considerably. No, thanks. Thanks, Gary. I think, uh, no, those ideas are, I think, on the money and, and quite insightful. And, you know, one of the things that we can do right away is around um, building partnerships and building the collective. So, so thanks for that insight. Um, Roger, we're really keen to hear your ideas and, and um, what, we, what we can do going, going forward. Well, as, as a general summary, and there's been lots of examples um, given, I think we have to really make a concerted effort to recognise and then maintain and build on the strengths that have come out of it. And those strengths I, I recognise when I go for my exercise walk uh, in passing people in the street, especially in a regional um, centre like, uh, like Ballarat, is that there is a sense of community, there's a sense of friendliness and understanding by, by fellow, of fellow man. Um, there's a, a offering of helping neighbours and uh, also what a pleasant thing to do to walk down the mall and see that all the seats have been cleaned, there's no rubbish around um, as, and that's been the motivation, but it's, it's a much more pleasant environment from a cleanliness point of view. They sound like little things, but they have a very positive influence on people's mental health. That's such a great point, Roger, because I think it is a combination of a lot of little things that improves um, not just our mental health and well-being, but our, our physical um, health and our willingness to, um, um, to, to be involved and, and to contribute. Um, I am very aware of time, Ian. I'd really value if there's anything you'd like to add about um, what you think we could do better in the future. Um, thank you, Anthony. I, I think the points that, are, that uh, fellow speakers have made have been very well made. 
um, I think building building links and and connections and uh, coalitions is really important. So can I just say uh, from this that we, in terms of the questions raised, we'd be very happy uh, to engage in some further dialogue and conversation about that, uh, following up from from this exercise, um, and and very open to to looking at uh, a connection into uh, the men's health organisations and network. Uh, particularly since we've recently changed our constitution to enable us to have organisations like yourselves in our national membership. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunities uh, that this conversation has opened up. That's that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Ian. And I'm sure Glenn will be in touch, um, maybe after the um, Men's Health Connect um, winds up to um, um, take those discussions forward. Um, before I hand back to Glenn, I just want to thank all our participants and if you can join me in thanking them either by waving your hands or hitting the clap signs on the... So thank you all so much to our participants. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, um, we do have a whole day talking around men's, older men's issues and, and that's not enough. <laughs> um, there are issues around um, diversity, retirement income, you know, a whole lot of things that were raised that we just didn't have a chance to even touch on adequately now. So um, I acknowledge that, but thank everybody um, for their participation. And just before we do say goodbye, I'll just hand back to Glenn for any final words. Thanks, Anne.